happily. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our Tuesday series that we call NDN Talks. We've uh, been doing this now for a few months. It's really been, uh, I think, one of the sort of most fun things we've done here at NDN in a long time in this crazy Zoom-based world that we're all living in uh, for now anyway. Um, today, I, I really am very excited about our session today. Um, and hopefully we'll have a good turnout. I know people are still dialing in. Um, I've asked Jessica Brandt from the Alliance for Securing Democracy, which is a project housed at the German Marshall Fund, um, to come talk about some work that she and her colleagues have been doing around, in, around propaganda and disinformation in the, in the global vaccine contest, as she calls it. Um, I think as somebody who ran a counter disinformation operation for an American political party in 2018, and was sort of at the beginning stages of a, a lot of the thinking around disinformation um, and uh, the state use of it, right? Not just the domestic use, but the state strategic state use. What I love about the work that Jessica and her team is doing is that it's so involved in strategy, right? I mean, it's about not just the tactics of like, how does all this work, which is a lot of the kind of coverage that we get, which is there was this guy doing this stuff and they were talking about this, but what's the end goal here? What's the game, right? What, what is the, how are nation states using this to advance their interests? A new tool in the old toolbox, right, so to speak. And I think the work they're doing is really, I think some of the best that any of the many organizations are doing now in this space. And Jessica has agreed to join us today to talk a little bit about their work. Um, and I should say that she's got a very traditional foreign policy background, right? I mean, Belfer Center at Harvard and Brookings and you know, worked uh, in multilateral issues, which is very critical for the stuff we're gonna talk about today and has uh, been doing a phenomenal job in, in leading this effort. So I just wanna turn it to you, Jessica, and say thanks so much for being here. Um, and uh, and uh, we're anxious to hear from you and to have you share your thoughts. And, Thanks for taking the time. Sure. Well, thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity. It's a treat to be um, to be with you all. Um, yeah, Simon asked me to talk a little bit about the global race to sort of shape um, narratives around the pandemic and in particular around vaccines. So what I thought I'd do if it works for all of you is just um, do a quick screen share and um, share some of the data that our team has generated over the past couple months. Um, and then we'll go, you know, quickly to discussion and, and try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, let me see if I can succeed at, uh, there we go. Is it on? Okay. It there. should be the green, yeah. There we go. Great. Um, so let me just say, you know, at the, at the outset that there's been um, a lot of focus on um, Russia and China's disinformation um, and propaganda efforts around um, COVID narratives. And the focus on disinformation, you know, it makes sense. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is the steady drumbeat of factual, but in aggregate misleading content that really shapes um, narratives and public views over time. And, you know, my argument is that this is arguably the more consequential challenge, right? Because it enables Russia and China to both, you know, claim that their coverage has been mis misrepresented, um, but it also presents very real challenges for governments and for platforms as they, as they try to push back. So what our team did looked at three months of data, um, Russia, China, and Iran, state media, their diplomats, their embassies, their ministries of foreign affairs on Twitter. Um, we started on November 9th, which is the day that Pfizer announced that it was uh, concluding its phase three trials. And that three month period really covered a lot of developments um, in this space. So let me just um, give you a snapshot of, of what we found. And in particular, I would just say we were looking at like, what did they say about their own vaccines and what did they say um, about one another's? Um, so, you know, broadly, you know, there were very few instances of promoting outright disinformation, but lots of examples of, you know, reports on safety concerns that were sensationalized or reported, you know, without the sort of key contextual um, context. So, you know, what you're looking at here is um, around, you know, FARS news agency um, tweeting that the Pfizer vaccine killed six people in America, um, omitting and never correcting that um, four of the six people who died received placebo. Um, and the two others, um, you know, authorities, um, uh, you know, showed that the, determined that there was no causal connection. Um, let me, here we go. Um, of the three COVID vaccines um, that were authorized for use during this period by the European Commission, so Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, um, 
Pfizer received far and away the most, um, the most coverage, uh, more than the other two combined. So you can see Pfizer here, um, you know, Moderna and AstraZeneca far behind. Um, interestingly, lots of coverage of, of Sputnik, and we can come back to that. Um, it was not just that they received the most coverage, but the most negative coverage. Um, here you can see, you know, Pfizer, 43 out of 50 total tweets that um, we collected during this period were coded as, um, by our, by our um, human coders, were coded as negative, so it's 86%. Um, they either mentioned an adverse reaction to the vaccine or negative information about the producer. Um, and here's a bunch of just kind of a sample so you can see what we're talking about. 13 faces paralyzed after the Pfizer vaccine in Israel. Hundreds of Israelis get co infected with COVID-19 after receiving the Pfizer uh, vaccine um, and on and on. Um, and in Iranian government and state media tweets, same thing, it was like 90% of mentions of Pfizer um, were negative. Um, Russia was the most likely to suggest that linkages um, you know, between the Pfizer vaccine and subsequent deaths um, of vaccine recipients. Um, this is some samples of that content. It's not totally clear why Pfizer got you know, much more negative attention than Moderna. Um, a couple of you know, sort of possibilities as the first Western vaccine, it was kind of seen as the key competitor. Um, there were a bunch of sort of safety you know, concerns that popped up during this period. So maybe that made it a little bit more of an easy target. It's also possible that just as a more globally recognized brand, Pfizer was a better target for sort of anti-big pharma, anti-capitalist, anti-American uh, campaigns. Um, this is, you know, so coverage of AstraZeneca uh, really took a U-turn um, after December when there was an announcement of this deal to test the combination of the Sputnik V and AstraZeneca um, vaccines. So, you know, this, this, what we have here is, um, you know, Dmitry Kislyov referring to the AstraZeneca vaccine as a monkey vaccine. Um, this was before December. And then after we see, you know, the embassy in Chile and RT in Espanol, which is one of the most widely retweeted and followed accounts um, in our data set, you know, sort of extolling the virtues um, of this partnership. Um, and I should just say like Russia and China, you know, they sort of aggressively promoted their own vaccines, but they really didn't promote one another's. Um, yeah, so another, I guess, maybe key takeaway is that Russia, China, and Iran, all three of them, um, they really promoted the theory that mainstream Western media outlets are providing biased coverage. They're ignoring these safety concerns um, related to Western vaccines. This is some of the examples um, that we pulled from China's coverage. Um, you know, what about following up? Hello. Um, you know, Pfizer as a pharmaceutical giant based in New York is an aspect of the healthcare corporate monopoly. And so we're you know, preserving the monopoly. You can read it. It's, um, it's sort of uh, questioning the motives of uh, Western media. Um, this really wasn't sort of supported by our own reviews. So we, we also collected like a control group um, of uh, global media outlets, and we took a look. So, what did you know? What did, for example, we have RFERL here? Um, there were, um, I guess, twenty-three tweets during this period that mentioned, you know, Sputnik Five from RFERL. Only four of them, so less than twenty percent, um, were negative. And the major incidents that the Western press was accused of ignoring, like um, you know, these deaths in a nursing home in Norway, they really were covered by. Western outlets, you know, with, with more context. Um, interestingly, Iran's coverage of Pfizer and Moderna took a, took a sort of more negative turn after Khamenei's decision um, to ban the importation of all vaccines that were produced in the US and the UK. Um, but despite the ban, you know, Iran continued to uh, make moves towards importing um, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And state media sort of justified this contradiction by claiming that it's not a British vaccine, it's a Swedish vaccine. Um, and I think, you know, what this sort of shows is that, you know, geopolitics is a driver, but so is need, right? Like they just, they need the vaccine and they're, and so. Um, and maybe I'll just speed through the end, but what you're looking at here are, you know, Russia, Russian and Chinese accounts that received the most likes and retweets during the period um, that we captured. And you can see that Twitter accounts affiliated with um, embassies in countries that either approved the Russian or Chinese vaccines um, or were in the process of doing so uh, received more followers and substantially more engagement than diplomatic accounts in other countries. And this is especially the case in Latin America where we're getting our butt kicked. 
Um, I think it's four of 10, I think, accounts here. Uh, I think it's by retweets are targeted at um, you know, Spanish speaking users um, and audiences in Latin America. You can see um, far and away um, Brazil here as you know, the most um, uh, you know, highest, most liked and most retweeted account. Um, you know, this coincides with the period in which there was sort of a kerfuffle, Brazil sort of a point, uh, reported very disappointing um, Sinovac efficacy results. And then you know, China kind of launched a aggressive media push. Um, and in the end, um, Brazil approved the vaccine. Um, I think I will leave it there, except to say that all of this is, you know, there's a paper with all of this and a lot more um, that was written by some really great colleagues. And all of it is pulled from our Hamilton 2.0 dashboard, um, where you can yourself go and, and tool around and look at, you know, Russia, China, and Iran's um, activities uh, you know, on Twitter, YouTube, websites, their UN statements, you can search by dates, you can search by, you know, issues that you might be, that you might care about. Um, and so I just invite you to, to do that. Um, but anyway, I just thought I'd throw some of that out there to ground our conversation and give yeah. you a sense of what we're actually up against and then, you know, off to your questions. So Jess, how do you <clears throat> just project forward a little bit here? I mean, since um, in the last few weeks, it certainly seems like the American, you know, this is our media bias perhaps coming through here, but that the American based vaccines have really um, started uh, creating distance between themselves and the many of the vaccines around the world. And that if you, um, and the Times, by the way, has a great story today about a whole new, new technology, a low cost vaccine that is being tested now that may come on the market. In the next few months, um, that's going to be geared towards the third world. There was a, I had not read about it, but not owned by big pharma. But what's your sense about the intensity here about what's going to happen? I mean, what what's given what you've seen? Do you expect this to become uh, a country by country battle where the China, the Chinese and the Russians are trying to blunt the ability of the Americans to kind of uh, you know, if, if, if it looks like American vaccines are coming in to run up the score, so to speak, right, given how much further ahead we are in many of our vaccines. I mean, how do you see this playing out over the next few months? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot at stake, right? It's, it's not just a, you know, a tool for sort of burnishing your own image. It's actually, um, you know, there's a lot at stake in the diplomatic sphere, but there's also a lot at stake in the in sort of the economic consequences. Um, and so I, I do think that this is um, a place where both Russia and China, and I would, I would argue to a lesser extent Iran, given that it doesn't have a, a vaccine competitor of its own, um, will play. You know, I think interestingly, um, you know, we've seen these actors be quite sophisticated at tailoring their message to the context, right? So we see China, Using its embassy accounts in countries that are, you know, in in um, in the global south, in places that are warm, to highlight the difficulties of cold chain storage and, you know, why Western vaccines just really aren't going to work there. Um, or, you know, as I said, we're getting our butt kicked in Latin America. Um, you know, sort of in places with an anti-capitalist bent, really highlighting the, you know, capitalist motives of Western big pharma um, in an effort to sort of dent the appeal of those vaccines. So I think. You you know, that the extent to which, you know, these, these actors are, um, are, you know, attempting with some sophistication to play in this space, I think is a suggestion of like, just how seriously they take it. And when you zoom out and think about like, what is, what are Russia and China's like broader meta goals, right? It's about um, denting democracy's appeal and, um, you know, sort of making our systems and way of doing business look less attractive than theirs. Um, and this is a this is a pretty useful way um, of doing that. It's also, you know, about, um, yeah, hi, I guess highlighting the strengths of their model. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, you know, to the extent this is sort of a struggle over um, systems, um, this, this, there's a clear link here. So yeah, I think this is going to be an intense um, domain of, of competition. It was first, it was about, you know, first it was mass diplomacy. Now it's vaccine diplomacy. And, and I would argue like vaccines are even more consequential than, than masks given, just given the economics. Um, next question uh, for you is, um, what's the role of the U.S. government in all of this? Uh, you know, we, this will be the first administration that in this new age of disinformation that will be really taking all of this very seriously, right? And 
you know, clearly the Biden foreign policy view is very much would care about all of this and understands the significance. Joe Biden and his team have repeatedly talked about uh, how Joe Biden has said himself, right, that we need to show that democracy can work, right? We have to demonstrate the good work that we can do to show to the rest of the world that democracy is a better system. What does the State Department do? What does our all of our propaganda apparatus, right, that we have, is this something we get involved in or is this up to the private sector companies to carry their own load here? What, what do you think the, the model is or how we, we yeah. manage all this? Yeah, so, I mean, it's an asymmetric competition and Russia and China, you know, deliberately choose tools that are to their, they believe, and I think they're right, are to their advantage, at least in the short term, right? So open information spaces, um, I think are tremendous advantages for democracies over the long run, but they make us a little bit vulnerable to, you know, to, to manipulation. Um, and here I'm talking, you know, about the kind of content I showed you, but also some of the more like true disinformation that we're talking about. Um, and so we emphatically should not um, sort of respond in kind, right? Like the, you know, Democrat, like democracy depends on the idea that the truth is knowable, that like citizens can discern it, that we can use it for self-governance. Like we need a healthy and vibrant information space. Autocrats don't. Um, that's why they're choosing these, you know, that's why they're choosing these tools in now. Um, so I think, you know, to kind of engage in our own forms of manipulation would be short-sighted um, because we'll only do more damage to ourselves um, and to, right, we only like depress trust in our own institutions and our own like way of doing business when we do that. And I think we have more to lose than our competitors when, um, when if we engage in that kind of behavior. Um, but that doesn't mean there's nothing that we can do about it. I think, you know, we do need to sort of seize the initiative in the information competition. I mean, first we need to recognize that we are in an information competition, that informa the information domain, um, along with the political and economic domain, and I would argue also the technology domain um, is, you know, is a domain of competition today and that that competition is persistent. Um, and so I think we need, you know, arms of our government to recognize that fact and to you know, proactively um, contest the information space with an affirmative positive vision that's rooted in truth. And so what that means is like, look at look at this, like these are, you know, you have state, um, large state media apparatuses that are regularly feeding all of this content um, in a targeted way into the information ecosphere. We cannot just tweet something once, like have a statement, tweet it once or, and think that we are done. Um, we cannot just um, implement a policy and a little bit later think about how we want to talk about it. Like we need to integrate the information um, competition in early into the decision making process and like throughout the policy making process. So um, I think like regular, affirmative, proactive communication um, that highlights the strength of our own model um, and our own way of doing business um, and is married to, you know, it's a little bit beyond my like uh, sort of traditional scope, but I would argue is like married to, you know, Samantha Power, for example, has called for, um, you know, what's her piece in foreign affairs, the can do power, right? Like, let's go out there um, and provide what only the United States can and marry that up with, with a good um, and positive, um, you know, information uh, campaign. I think that's, that's the way, that's the way to go. And if you were talking to Moderna and uh, Pfizer and uh, Johnson & Johnson, would your advice be that they've got to pay attention to this and they've got to take some more responsibility for managing their own activities in these countries? I mean, does, does corporate America who play in this global arena need to beef up their own offensive, you know, not propaganda, but just storytelling, right? To get their story out. Do they have to get louder, do you think, uh, given what you're seeing here? Yeah, I mean, I think there's roles are these like vibrant, um, you know, the vibrant private sector. And, um, and so, yes, I think it would be helpful. Um, I think it would be helpful. Hey, can I ask you to turn, um, we're going to go to Q&A, if you can turn off the screen share. Oh, sure. So, yeah, you no, know, it's just, it's great. It's great. That was helpful. It actually, you referenced it during your, your conversation. So folks, we're going to open it up to the audience here. And there's two ways all of us are Zoom warriors is, Jess said earlier, um, there's you can type a question in the Q and A box, or you can raise your hand, uh, and then I can call on you and I can bring you into the the conversation. Um, 
and I know we've got some folks who are working on these issues in their day jobs uh, on the in the group here. So if you want to jump in, there's one of two ways to do so. We do have a, a question here. Um, so this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what accounts for Latin America's high level of engagement with Russian and Chinese disinfo? So I look at it maybe the other way around, which is what accounts for Russia and China's targeted push um, in Latin America. Um, and it's a, it's a big market um, for these vaccines. And um, it's a market for vaccines and it's a market for hearts and minds. And so, um, you know, they sort of made an aggressive, an aggressive push in that domain. And we, we saw, for example, that Lopez Obrador, right, I think bought both port, some Mexican, I mean, uh, Chinese and Russian vaccine early. It wasn't large amounts, right? But he was playing footsie with, with these guys, right? And it's one of the reasons I think they got so engaged was that they had a beachhead in an actual sale, right? With a very prominent Spanish speaking country. Um, and uh, I think that what happens in Mexico, I think is gonna be particularly interesting uh, yeah. over the next couple of months. The, the Russian embassy account in Mexico, um, it, you know, received like, I th I'm pretty sure far and away the most retweets um, and likes of like, we surveyed like almost a thousand accounts um, and it was like next level, um, you know, outpacing accounts that have hundreds of times more followers. Like it was on a per tweet basis. Um, and, you know, the, we looked again at this narrow period, but it was a period in which Mexico um, granted emergency approval for Sputnik V. Yeah, and there there is, uh, I've done a little bit of work in, around the issue of disinformation in Latin America. And there is a vast uh, propaganda disinformation uh, machinery in, in Mexico. This is an area of enormous ongoing uh, information struggle uh, between us and some of our competitors. And this is not new. It's one of the reasons they were able to jump in here is the Russians have been making immense investments uh, on, in this space in, in Mexico for some time. And, and just broadly, I mean, RT and Espanol is always among the top, like, I don't actually have it up, the, but if you looked at our dashboard today, I'd venture to guess, like, RT and Espanol is up there. Um, these are these are big accounts with big followings, and there's sort of a lot of effort to, um, to generate that. Okay. Um, who's next? We've got more, lots more to talk about here. Um, and I, I want to come back to... I want to come back to something, um, you know, that I wrote about. I wrote a piece a few weeks ago, calling on the Biden administration. You know, they they rolled out just the um, sort of the, an initial strategy towards Asia, right, with a quad with India, Australia, um, and and Japan. Right, we're working with the U.S. to try to make sure that the Chinese didn't beat us badly in that space. I've called for. The, the Biden administration to develop a similar strategy for the Americas. And particularly given that we've seen now some significant breakouts in Canada just in the last you know week or so, P1 and the UK variant. And then in Brazil, obviously has been overwhelmed, which is starting to spread. Do you think that the Biden administration needs to get a little bit more aggressive? I know that we just got a, we just have a new person took over, just nominated in the State Department, right? Gail Smith was mm -hmm. nominated, but what's your sense about how, what the administration is gonna do to really lean into this and putting your more traditional foreign policy hat on here for a minute um, in terms of like, you know, are we gonna be the country that vaccinates the world? Are we gonna be the country that defeats COVID? Is that something that is, or are we gonna let COVAX do some of that work where we won't necessarily get the credit that we may want, you know? I mean, what's how's your sense about how this is going to play out? I mean, I hope so, right? I hope so. Oh, and like when I put on my strategy hat, like asymmetric competition is fundamentally about figuring out what your like what your competitors' asymmetries are, what are they leveraging, and then what are your own asymmetric advantages? And there are certain things that only we can do. Um, and so we got to lean into those advantages. So I think um I think um, you know there's a there's many ways like many places that we need to do that um, and 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 I would actually argue like we need to keep in mind that the information domain is like one of several domains, um, but in all of them like you know so thinking about what are what are authoritarians long term um, sort of disadvantages or what are asymmetric advantages of our own in the information space and it's as I said it's our um, our ability to do big things. Um, it's our ability to do good things. Um, it's our healthy and vibrant, um, you know, sort of 
um, civil society and news ecosystem that like speaks truth to power and keeps you know citizens informed. It's um, a public sector, uh, sorry, a, a private sector that can also like do big do big things. Um, and what are our you know authoritarians like sort of sources of fragility? Well, like in the long term, they're actually sort of fragile to open flows of information. Um, you know, and I think like. Part, so part of the information campaign that we need to launch needs to sort of emphasize what we can do married up with us doing sort of doing good stuff. Um, but I think we can also expose the failures and false promises of authoritarians, right? And I think we need to champion, you know, freedom, freedom of information on the internet worldwide um, because it, you know, accords with democratic values, but also because it puts authoritarians on the back foot. Um, and so, you know, we can be, we can and should be strategic um, ourselves about how, you know, how we can test the information space, leaning into our own advantages, um, which I would argue, like, often are quite closely tied to our values. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, exactly what the Biden administration will do um, in this domain, but I, I get a sense that they have a sense of the challenge, um, and I, and I hope that this will be a component of the strategy. Yeah, and, and the president, or Tony Blinken or the president said yesterday, you know, we want to demonstrate to the world that we can vaccinate our own people first, right? And then sure. before we lift our head up. And it was actually a very thoughtful way of approaching this, right? Which is, we have an obligation to take care of our own people before we start really leaning into the rest of the world the way that we we need to. But let me, let me go to Ryan, who's got a question. Hey, Ryan. Um, hey, Jessica, thanks very much for this report. Have you seen any evidence of Russia and China relying on information strategies regarding vaccine shipments to recipient countries. I'm wondering if China, Russia have relied on same information networks that sow distrust in Western vaccines to amplify positive stories of cooperation. Yeah, it's a good question. Nothing comes to mind for me, but it's um, but it's a good thought, and I'd be interested in digging into the into the data. Yeah, I haven't seen any any anecdotally. I haven't I haven't come across it, but I haven't been looking. So happy to do a little search and let you know what I find. I can tell you that in Mexico, uh, there was enormous. Um, Lopez Obrador made an, an enormous uh, amount of attention, drew attention to both Russia and China and the shipments when they came in and the purchase of them, and then also when they arrived. I mean, I just know this from having paid a little bit of attention to that. And that was the state doing it for obvious, their own internal, obvious mm -hmm. internal reasons. But I bet you, Ryan, that, you know, if Jess and her team dig into this, they're gonna find um, a lot of promoting of that in, in, in target countries, you know? We did do a targeted search back, mm, I wanna say, a little less than a year ago, um, when you know, sort of China was making its mask push um, in Europe, and there we saw a lot of the kind of content that you're talking about. Um, a lot of it, and right, it's about positioning, you know, China as the partner of first resort to to Europe at a time then when we were sort of on our own, on our on our back foot ourselves, and um, exacerbating the transatlantic, you know trying to exacerbate divides within the transatlantic alliance because it's an alliance that um, you know could um, take action that would constrain our people of Russia and China's um, interests globally. So these all none of these, as you guys know, like none of these um, all of these campaigns build on longstanding foreign policy and other objectives. I've got a question from Phil from GSK, uh, a pharmaceutical company regarding biopharma industries efforts to amplify accurate narrative. I would argue the media's ongoing bias against the industry result in any amplification being considered propaganda. In light of that, how would you suggest industry engage without creating additional barriers, real or perceived, to vaccine uptake? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think we need like all actors of society to be a part of this. So like, I think that it is, um, you know, the role, like, I think amplifying true and correct information um, is like, what companies should do and civil society actors will, you know, amplify what they, you know, kind of, so everyone's got to play their role, right? So like, yeah, yeah, like media and an independent society is skeptical um, and we should want to do that over the long run, like that's a strength. Um, but I, so, but I don't think that, I don't know that I see, but maybe you do. And so like, give me, give me more of a sense, but like how, 
um, highlighting true and accurate information about um, the you know uptake of your vaccines or how um, how rollout campaigns are going. Like I don't know, I I see that as only a positive. You know, uh, Jess, I wrote a piece back at um, the end of September saying that I felt that the global effort to defeat COVID and build back better was one of America's most uh, significant soft power opportunities since the end of the world, you know, at the end of World War II, coming right at the heels of Trump, who sort of burned down and used up so much of the residual soft power that he was given that was accru accrued over a very long period of time. I mean, it sounds like that one of the reasons you're so motivated to do this work is that you agree with that, that you see this as sort of a once in a generation opportunity to tell the American story. Um, and particularly because the vaccines are going so well, right? I mean, not only, I mean, this has been, since you got into this, it's been sort of amazing to see what's actually happened, right? With all the vaccines. And we even have two or three more that may be coming, you know, uh, down the pike. So what's your sense? It seems like the Biden team is very, very, uh, you know, attuned to this. They understand the strategic opportunity uh, how do you think it's going so far? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great <laughs> to have, uh, you know, to have a team in place that I think does, as you say, understand um, how, like, how the information contest is married up to these other, um, to our broader efforts to succeed in an era of renewed geopolitical competition. Um, and is marrying those um, actions or marrying sort of the policy proposals to values, um, understanding that those values are strengths. Um, so I think it's great. I think it's early, like who knows how it'll go. I mean, I, I, I observe, um, you know, how the vaccine rollout is going on, going in the United States, like every other citizen, it's not, you know, sort of a domain of expertise for me, um, but, um, you know, have been delighted to see, um, you know, the extent to which it's going well. And I'm, you know, sort of, pleased to see that it seems like there are, um, as you suggest, like more coming down the line. And I think, and I think, you know, Samantha Power is right. Like we can do where they can do power. We can do big things um, and we should. So I have one more if nobody else is going to jump in and we're going to, we're coming to the end. We usually try to end about 40 after is that um, give us your just big picture sense now that you've done this deep dive and this information competition, this domain, as you talk about it, what are you thinking about over the next couple of years? What are the other things that are kicking around in your head that you're worried about, that you're excited about, that you're interested in, that you haven't had time to, to dive into? I mean, what's out there as we have, again, an administration that's actually going to play far more aggressively in this space than the previous one? Um, right. I mean, what's your sense? Of what, what are you thinking about? What's got your your interest? For me, it's watching how Russia and China's strategies are evolving. I think you know we face a very different problem than we faced in 2016, which was you know a problem that caught us flat-footed. Um, but and we need to learn the lessons of that experience. But we need not overlearn the lessons of that experience because I think there are like some very important differences. So, you know, on the China front, right? China is a rising power with a lot to lose. That's traditionally been considerably um, more risk averse, patient in its strategy. Um, and in the COVID era, we've seen, you know, some of the sort of old rules break um, and this, you know, flirtation with outright disinformation, the, you know, the perpetuation of multiple conflicting conspiracy theories about the virus's origins to deflect blame, um, you know, sort of taking pages out of Russia's playbook. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, there were like a handful of Chinese embassy and diplomatic accounts on Twitter, like a few of them operating with really no apparent coordination, really not a lot of strategy. Like I think the US, UK, the UK embassy came late. Like, you know, there were embassy accounts in countries we probably wouldn't think had much strategic importance to China and then not accounts for embassies that were very, um, you know, sort of strategically important um, and not a clear sense that they were operating in any sort of, you know, coordinated manner. And that's completely changed. And part of that was because of Hong Kong. Um, but I think a lot of it's due to COVID. So now we have like four times as many diplomatic accounts acting aggressive, diplomats on Twitter acting aggressively, peddling outright disinformation. This is something we, you know, wouldn't have imagined um, some time ago. And I think it'll be really interesting to watch whether this is a one-time departure from a broader, you know, as I said, more patient strategy, 
um, because the coronavirus crisis is uniquely sort of salient to Chinese interests, or if this is the new normal and this is like what we should expect going forward. So I, I think that's fascinating. And then on the Russia front, like Russia does not need large quantities of troll farm content to upend our domestic politics with polarizing narratives. Like we are doing that to ourselves. Um, and so like, I don't, that's not good news. Um, and so instead, you know, what we see are these more targeted um, information operations that are really, you know, signs that they're driven by Russian military intelligence. They're using domestic actors to launder material. It's a much harder challenge. And as I said, it's a very different challenge than the troll farm challenge in 2016 um, and even really 2018. Uh, and so um, like, watching how that how like our defenses are evolving but russia's activities are evolving in response to those defenses and so watching how that um goes forward i think is also um going to be uh going to be sort of top of mind so those are the things that i'm i'm sort of keeping one, of, one of the reasons i wanted you to come today is that i in my own learning i've done in this space one of the things that really impacted my early thinking was a paper that Kate Starbird, who's out at Washington State, at the University of Washington did on, um, which was how she got into this, which was that she was tracking online narratives around the Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill and that she found and her researchers found, you know, clear presence of Russian manipulation in the space, which seemed to have more of a commercial, you know, uh, manifestation than a, than a purely political one. And I, I've always found that to be also something that is kind of fascinating for Phil's question about GSK is that, you know, for private American companies to recognize that the Russian government may be entering into their commercial space for their own, their own either commercial or diplomatic or foreign policy objectives as part of this permanent growing awareness that we all have about this information competition. And, and it's why I think this, Watching how the pharmaceutical companies themselves, um, you know, manage this. Do they bring on bigger social media teams? Do they start setting up their own accounts in each of these countries and sort of waging some of these battles? Fascinating stuff to watch, right? Because it's a completely different way of of the companies having to think about where they fit into all of this. And as you pointed out, some of that in Russia and China is being carried by the state, whereas here it's not going to be carried by the state and nearly as much. I mean, there'll be some of it, but it'll be incidental as opposed to central. And, and I think, you know, the question is, do large companies that play in the world have to take all of this kind of daily, the way that we think about it in politics, does this have to be, you know, brought into their internal brand um, protection world every day because they're operating in a space with hostile powers. And I think that's going to be the other as you get further into this, it'll be interesting to see how you develop your own deeper thinking about that because it's it's we have a we have more distance with our companies on these things, right? It's a different structure. And it's complicated because some companies are capable of operating in a more sophisticated way in this space. Many aren't. It's not what they do, right? And so I, I don't know if you want to just end with any thinking about that uh, as a way of sort of bringing in any final thoughts you may have. And yeah. Jess, thanks for being with us. This has been fascinating. I love this work. I think this is some of the most interesting stuff that's happening in this sort of new foreign policy world that we're all living in. I'm grateful for all the great work your team has done. Yeah, no, it was a treat. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, I'll just put some that there are rules for every sector of society in this effort. Um, and there are things that um, you know private companies can do and there are things that only government can do. Um, we need both. And, um, you know, like democracies are messy and fraught and that is like precisely the sort of challenge that our autocratic uh, competitors are pressing on um, in the near term, but over the long term, um, this is a strength. So I, you know, I think the adversarial press, um, vibrant private sector companies acting in their economic interests um, and, you know, and, and, and thoughtful uh, government stewardship um, are all important components of, of a strategy to shore up our vulnerabilities at home um, and then to figure out what our advantages are and to go out there and, um, and, uh, and seize them. Go fight, win. Um, and uh, listen, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, next week, we're going to be having a person come talk from the administration, I, I hope it looks like about 
the new American Jobs Plan, which is obviously the big new play from, from Biden world. And then the week after that, we have a very exciting event with uh, two old friends, Andre Cherney and Kenny Bear, who just were recently profiled in the New York Times for the journal that they founded many years ago called Democracy Journal. I was actually on the founding uh, advisory board of the Democracy Journal uh, when they began and was involved in helping Kenny and Andre get that off the ground. Really pleased to see the great attention they got from the New York Times as having been uh, one of the primary intellectual incubators for the new Biden administration. They're gonna be coming and reflecting on their time with democracy and giving some thoughts about the current state of play in American politics. So we've got some terrific events coming up. Jess, keep up the good work. And by the way, what's the, anyone who wants to follow your work, what's the URL? I know we link to it on our site, but is there a URL, uh, the best URL for- Yeah, it's, um, why don't you follow at Secure Democracy on Twitter? And that's where all our best stuff is. Okay. Okay, take care, Jess. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much.